Hello, my name is Caroline Heldman, and I am the Executive Director of the Representation Project. We are a nonprofit organization founded by Jennifer Siebel Newsom that uses films and campaigns to challenge harmful gender norms and stereotypes. The interview that you've joined us uh, for today is part of our Boys Will Be Boys campaign to expose how traditional masculinity restricts boys and men and to create a space where they can reach their full human potential. Uh, boys will be boys to us means that boys will be anything they want to be without the constraints of norms of masculinity. And I am so delighted to be interviewing Cam Frazier today about men's sexuality. This fits so well with our theme that this series is a love letter to boys and men because we care about their pain and suffering and we care about them thriving. So let me tell you about Cam. You are in for a treat. Um, I will say Cam did ask uh, whether or not he could curse. Um, so just be prepared for that because he's Australian. That's what he said, not me. Uh, but Cam is a professional sex coach certified with the World Association of Sex Coaches. Um, I can see people typing this right now. Oh my goodness, I can be a certified sex coach. Yes, you can. Um, Cam has a graduate degree in sexology. Cam is also a certified sexologist and the current deputy chair for the Society of Australian Sexologists. Cam is the author of a great new book called The New Male Sexuality, Masculinity, Sexuality, Male Bodies, and Men's Experiences of Pleasure. Welcome, Cam. So good to see you. Hi, Carolyn. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's good to see you as well. So it's super early in the morning. We'll start off <laughs> with a question I know you can answer, which is, how did you get involved in this work? At what point in your life, you know, what set you on that path? And at what point in your life did you know that you would be serving boys and men? Yes, thank you for easing me in uh, at 5 a.m. here into the questions. Uh, so being a sex coach and working with men around sexuality wasn't something that when adults asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up was something that I said, you know, I was actually interested in engineering and going into uh, mechanical and mechatronic engineering. However, I started doing a few of those units at university and quickly realized this is not what I want. This is not what I like. I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. It is too, um, it was too boring, right? I was really interested in doing the psychology classes and the sociology classes as part of like the liberal arts degree um, the undergrad and it was it was something that like really sparked me you know uh, my my desire and my passion and my enthusiasm was really sparked by those um, those psychology classes and so I started I started you know doing a little bit more of that and I spoke to a guidance counselor they said yeah if that's what's interesting to you like change paths and go down into to psychology and so I thought yeah I can do that and my idea was to go into like clinical psych to begin with and uh, I was you know, I was really interested as a, as a young, you know, teenage boy is, I was, I was interested in sex, you know, I was, I, I wanted to have sex, I was interested in sex, I was masturbating, I was watching porn, sex was a part of my life. And what I, what I kind of tried to do was mask my interest in sex by framing it as like being a, a something that I studied. So like all my psychology papers that I had to write for my undergrad degree were like related to sexuality somehow because I was like oh, I just want to learn more about sex I kind of had this interest in it and this just gave me an avenue to kind of like write you know abnormal psychology papers on you know particular sexual fetishes yeah and I was like oh that's an interesting way for me to actually go and read about sexual fetishes for a, you know uh, as a bit of a scapegoat for, for uh, my classes but through doing that I you know I kind of really developed such a uh like a, a passion to to learn more about sexuality kind of like really started to light me up and I was like I just had this this really beautiful um realization that this is what I want to do with my life I was like this is this is you know where I want to go I can see myself really doing this for work um and that's like the so that's like the the professional light bulb so to speak but I also had a series of like really personal light bulbs that went off for me that that made me realize that this work is is quite necessary and so the, the first is you know, as a young man, uh, you know, as a, as a teenage boy, I was a collegiate athlete in America. So I went to an American university and the American university that I went to, I won't name it, but the, the tagline of the university was unapologetically Baptist. So it was in rural Georgia and the, 
Uh, and so the, the town that it was in was quite small, quite conservative, quite religious. And the, the, one of the classes that I took, for example, was uh, a Christian approaches to human sexuality. And so within that, that class, we learned that homosexuality is a sin, that premarital sex is a sin, that um, contraceptives are a sin. You know, like there was a lot of shaming of sexual expression and the relationships that I saw there, if I like think retro, uh, retrospectively now, were very unhealthy and, uh, and, and abusive to a degree as well. There was a lot of emotional abuse uh, and there was some physical abuse in those relationships with young, young people. You know, I was there when I was 17. And, um, and that was kind of the first light bulb moment that I had of like, oh, wow, there's, there's people that need education. There's people that need some, some, you know, sexuality and relationship education. And then it's like dire because there's, there's some kids that are really unsafe. You know, that my, I remember having friends who are in abusive relationships and uh, like really like girls getting pregnant as well. Like they're like, my friends, you know, I was, I was 17 there. So these, these are 17 uh, year old, year old uh, men and boy, uh, you know, boys and girls, I suppose. And so that was like one light bulb moment. The other was uh, like my own experience of sexuality as well. So as a, uh, you know, as a teenage boy, I was drinking quite a lot. In fact, that was my coping mechanism, uh, particularly living away from home as a 17 year old and in another country across the other side of the world and feeling a little bit out of my depth and wanting to fit in. The way that I did that was uh, by leaning into the Australian larrikin personality and drinking a lot. Essentially, I was known as the Aussie dude who could you know, hold his liquor. And so that became, like I said, a coping mechanism for a lot of the insecurity and the anxiety that I had about not only me as a young man, you know, as a, as a, you know, during my formative years, becoming a, becoming a man, um, you know, I was part of the locker room culture because I was a collegiate athlete and I, I was never really like the best athlete. And a lot of like, at least in my experience growing up, a lot of like your masculinity was, uh, I guess, revolved around how good you were at sport or how manly you were perceived to be. And sport was an avenue for expressing your manliness. Uh, but I wasn't like the greatest athlete on the team. I was good enough to play, but not, you know, I, I was never like, super fit or had a you know muscular frame or anything like that so i felt quite insecure about my body and being in those like male uh dominated spaces and so you know compensated by drinking uh, and you know finding an avenue to express my manliness through how much alcohol i could consume that was also a mask for my like sexual insecurities and anxieties as well so i had a lot of performance anxiety you know, I was really performing my masculinity in a sense, you know, in those locker rooms and, and really trying to fit in because I was worried about being ostracized or bullied or made fun of or called names. Uh, and that, that performance of masculinity or, or, you know, performance anxiety also trickled into the, well, it didn't trickle, but it flooded, I would say, into the bedroom as well. And, um, and the sexual experiences that I had you know, for a period of about five years when I was in university, uh, I, don't think I, had, uh, I don't think I had sex sober for five years. Mm. Uh, I think every single sexual experience I had was under the influence. And the major reason for that was because I was afraid of like being sexual. I was, I was afraid of not lasting long enough. I was afraid of not getting a hard dick. I was afraid of not being good enough and, you know, disappointing my sexual partners i was afraid of like my mates thinking that something was wrong with me i was afraid i just had this fear and anxiety and so i drank in order to quell those fears and then the booze became also an uh, like a scapegoat for any like sexual experiences that were that were shit you know i could be like oh it wasn't me i was just too fucked up i was just too drunk i just had too much to drink and so i had this and looking back at it now, I have this kind of realization that a lot of the times I was having sex, not for me, not for the young woman who I was being sexual with, but for my mates. So I could tell them a funny story at the end of the day, or I could like, rec like recount how much I'd drunk and then I'd gone home with someone. And then like, it just really was this, this very, like I wasn't really mentally healthy, right? I wasn't mentally well. That was like my coping mechanism was, was to drink because of that. And so the, um, 
yeah, so the the thing that got me out of that, I suppose, was uh, I seriously hurt my back. I, I fractured my lower spine. And part of my clinical rehabilitation for that in order to play sport again was to go to Pilates. And through Pilates, you know, using um, the reformer, you know, I started tuning in to my body much more I started noticing how much tension I was carrying how much tightness was around my back and hips and pelvis and you know uh, how much I was clenching my jaw um my Pilates instructor said go and see a yoga teacher because that's going to really complement your your uh, rehab and um and so I did I went and did some yoga and vividly remember having experiences on the yoga mat halfway through a class like bursting out into tears or noticing all this frustration and, and rage just bubble up to the surface, emotions I'd been suppressing, you know. Um, and I don't want to give the I don't want to give the impression that at the time I was like super enlightened and like, yeah, men should have emotions. Because I went and saw a counselor and my intention for going and seeing the counselor as a you know 18, 19 year old was I have to get rid of these emotions. <laughs> I need someone to tell me these emotions are uh, are bad and I need to get rid of them. Um, and Thankfully, my, my counselor didn't do that. They actually put me onto a psychologist and we did narrative therapy together. And that was like a game changer for me in terms of like really understanding who I was. Narrative therapy, for those who are unfamiliar, is essentially just like looking at all the stories that you tell yourself of who you're supposed to be. For me in particular, that was as a man, you know, as a Australian man, as a sexual man, as, you know, someone who's interested in psychology, you know, all these stories about and labels that I adhered to. And Kind of discerning whether or not they were beneficial for me, whether or not they were my stories or they've been externally imposed upon me by society, by parents, by religion, whatever it might be, and rewriting those narratives, rewriting those scripts. What are those stories that I want to tell myself and how do I want to show up in the world? Uh, and so, you know, that combination of body-based work, Pilates and yoga, and then through those modalities like meditation and massage and breath work and things like that, and then talk-based therapy were the things that like rapidly shifted the way that I showed up in the world as a man uh, at around the age of like 19, 20, 21. And, um, and yeah, I, I, to, okay, I guess to cut a long story short, like started having better sex because I was much more comfortable with like my own body. And I was much more comfortable being vulnerable and expressing my emotions. And I was much more comfortable like being playful and, and, you know, and letting my guard down and asking my partner, communicating with them and admitting that I didn't know what the fuck I was doing and wanting to like be curious about their experience and just like, you know, doing all the things that I kind of talk about now. Um, and then, you know, I was able to breathe properly and I was able to slow down and relax my body. So all the sexual difficulties that I was having also kind of fell away uh, and I wasn't drinking so much because I was in a better mental health space. And, and I started you know, noticing that my relationships with men changed as well. I started standing up for myself a little bit more. I started standing up for other people as well. You know, in the locker room when there was stuff being talked about or people being denigrated, I would you know, call people out. I'd call their shit out. And so like, there was this shift in the way that I felt comfortable around men as well because of the, the work that I was doing and, and feeling more secure and, and authentic in myself. And uh, so those, those kind of two experiences, the kind of interest that I had in sex and that being fueled by psychology, with these like really personal revelations around my masculinity and my sexuality kind of fused together. And I was like, I got to do this. I, you know, I, I, this is what lights me up. This is what I'm really passionate about. This is what I really want to do. And so the stuff that I put out online today or just put out into the world is the stuff that I wished someone had told me 15 years ago. Yeah. You know, I, I just turned 30 and my, like the lack of sex education is, you know, ridiculous that I've had, you know, so the, the, stuff that I, I I'm learning about and stuff that I talk about is, is I wish there was a man that was you know 15 years older when I was you know, 15, 16, who was able to like compassionately, empathetically talk to me about sex and sexuality and consent and all the feelings that might be going on because it was, I was just flying blind and it did not do me any good. It didn't do my sexual partners any good. And I'm sure that I hurt uh, several people along the way. So yeah, really trying to, trying to shift that that perspective around masculinity and and, um, and and just heal a younger version of myself as well in the process. So be that adult you wish you had or someone would have told you. And Cam, I find that there is a universal interest in talking about sex. When I teach sex classes, there's such a relief. They get to, to research it right under the guise of research. 
<laughs> because it's such a, a fundamental part of the human experience, such a great part of the human experience that we have pathologized and you know done all that and moralized and and done a lot of things that may, that keep it in the shadows. But I think what's so amazing about your journey, you know, this kind of beautiful evolution, um, is that it really touched upon so many points that of, of commonality, so many men experiences, right? the pressure of the man box to perform a certain type of masculinity, which means engaging in high-risk behaviors like drinking and performance anxiety and expectations about penis size and performance that come into play. And then, you know, also everything that um, you talked about uh, in terms of unwanted sex, which we we talked a little bit about before we started here, um, and then realizing that you had emotions and then becoming vulnerable. Um, and it, it really ties into to what the the bow that you put on it which is this is what i would have wanted to know and you open your book with the line you have been lied to about sex so talk to us about some of the most common ways we've been lied to what are some common myths about sex that we can bust yeah thank you for prompting that question so you've been lied to about sex is a bit of a um hyperbolic statement but like the the idea is that there are stereotypes and particularly like what i call myths about masculinity and men's experiences of sex and sexuality that I think are detrimental to not only men, but the people they're being sexual with. And one of the major ones that I have found, uh, and this, you know, is really unpacked by someone who I'd love to, to credit. Her name's Sarah Hunter-Murray. She's a Canadian sex researcher, and she's got a book called Not Always in the Mood, which is fantastic. And um, one of the things that you know she really looks at in her book and something that I've observed a lot is this expectation that, uh, or assumption that men's sex drive is high unwavering unyielding and men just want to have sex all the time men will have sex at the drop of a hat men think about sex every seven seconds but there's this there's this you know myth that this male sexual drive is is peaking out all the time and it's always high and what i see in my work with men is a lot of guys thinking that if they don't want to have sex all the time something is wrong with them that they're that they're broken that they're somehow less of a man uh, i and you know i see a lot of i see a lot of guys as a matter of fact who don't have a high sex drive all the time think that they need to go and get testosterone replacement therapy because there's this conflation in you know the lay person understanding of sex drive and testosterone that it's a one-to-one -one thing that if you have more testosterone you have more sexual desire uh, but that's not the case. As a matter of fact, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, sure, there's a correlation there, but it isn't actually straightforward like that. Uh, so I see a lot of guys, you know, younger guys as well, who don't need testosterone replacement therapy, go and seek it out and boost their testosterone and become like a testosterone kind of junkie or zealot because they are not adhering to this narrative or this script that they should be having sex all the time or should be wanting to have sex all the time or should be like really hypersexual. And um, it's like, that's one way that I see it impacting guys. Uh, another one is uh, like how it impacts their partners as well. A lot of women have the same scripts and I work with heterosexual couples and, and heterosexual men for the most part. So like a lot of the women that they're sexual with have the same story that he is supposed to have a high, unwavering, unyielding sex drive. But if he doesn't, then something must be wrong. And uh, a lot of women can internalize that as well. And, and uh, my, from my conversations with them, one of the things they share with me is like a, a feeling of, oh, he doesn't want me. And so therefore he must not be attracted to me. Therefore I, I must be not hot enough or must, must not be doing enough or there must be something wrong with me. So the 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 internalization of there's something wrong, well, that, that's something wrong must be with me. And a lot of guys will you know also internalize there's something's wrong with me. That's why I need testosterone. But then sometimes the projection can happen and it's like, well, I don't think anything's wrong with me. It must be something wrong with her. I must not actually really like this woman or she must not be hot enough or, you know, we must be not having the sex that I want to have or whatever it might be. The, the projection then can start to happen. The externalization of the blaming can start to happen when, when really the truth is that sex drive fluctuates and that it isn't high and unyielding and unwavering all the time. And even for those people that do want to conflate testosterone to sex drive, which again, is not a one-to-one -one, you know, ratio, you have to admit that testosterone fluctuates. It's high in the morning and low in the evening, right? It's uh, got, variations through the seasons it's got variations in 20 and 30 day cycles like there's fluctuations in testosterone even people that are taking testosterone replacement therapy will take the 
either injections or the, the they'll they'll take the testosterone in a way that's meant to mimic natural variations in, of testosterone as well. So like this, um, I, I'm harping on about testosterone here because I I see a lot of that in like the men's spaces is like you know and and, and there's research to back this up that like it's on the rise the amount of people that are taking testosterone replacement you know therapy like therapeutic modalities or like you know trying to take testosterone supplements or whatever it might be like there's there's a huge increase of men doing that interestingly there's a huge increase of um young gay men doing it um you know which maybe speaks to a bit more nuance but um but like there's a lot of guys that are obsessed with like wanting to be more manly and testosterone is like framed as like the manly uh you know uh, endocrine response right like more testosterone equals more of a man and so being more of a man equals wanting to have more sex right and that like so all these conflations are made when we're cyclical beings as human beings right we have these beautiful cycles and these variations and these fluctuations and um you know and one of the this has been true for me yeah i can, I can speak to this experience one of the things that like some i'll just i'll just share my story so when I started to realize that I didn't want to have sex all the time, the there was kind of like two two major things came up for me here. When I started saying no to sex for the first time, because there was a period of my life where I just said sex, yes to sex if it was on the table, um, regardless of how intoxicated I was, how intoxicated the other person was, uh, how much I wanted it or didn't want it. Like I, I just said yes to sex. I, I felt like I was lucky to have sex. I felt like you know, sex was scarce you know, it was my, my mentality as a man, as a young man, particularly. And so like any sex that's on the table, I'll just say yes to, I, I very much bought into that idea. Kind of the mentality was uh, quantity over quality. Uh, right. And, and again, that was part of like performing masculinity. What does it mean to be a man, especially like as a young collegiate athlete was how much sex are you having? You know, like how, how, how much of a measure of success of manliness, um, you know, is there. And so uh, one of the realizations that I had when I stopped saying yes to sex because I was starting to respect my own boundaries was this, um, I, I said to, to you before, uh, you know, off air was like this revelation that, oh, I've said yes when I didn't want to have sex. I've crossed my own boundaries and have had sex when I didn't feel like it. Um, and that was like a really, like that. And I, I remember the, the specific, I was doing a workshop with uh, another um, amazing practitioner. Her name's Betty Martin. Uh, she has a book called The Wheel of Consent, which I highly recommend checking out. And doing part of one of her workshops uh, for professional you know development purposes and and being the only man in the space as well mind you like i had this really intense realization that like i had just been following expectations and assumptions and sexual scripts about what it means to be a man and they weren't my stories you know that it was it was an external expectation from whoever right i just picked it up probably probably from my mates that like I should be the one that escalates sex. I should be the one that pursues sex. And if I don't, then and here's where the other kind of like realization that I had at, at, at a point in my journey was like saying no to sex must mean that I'm gay. Right? If I turn down sex with a woman, that automatically must mean that I'm gay. And, and that has come from myself, from other guys, and also from women themselves. I've had several women say to me when I've said no to sex, or I've, I've you know, rejected and, and declined sex from them, have turned around and said, what are you, gay? Like that, that was the response uh, again, because there's a story that women have that well, men will just say yes to sex and men will want to have sex all the time. And, and, you know, and so that kind of homophobia, right. Internalized homophobia of like being what, like not wanting to be labeled gay. And then also the realization that I'd crossed my own boundaries, like was a really intense experience to, to unpack. And I, you know, it was made even more intense and 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 more i guess profound when i had the kind of secondary realization that if i've crossed my boundaries and i've had sex when i don't want to then i have most definitely had sex when other people didn't want to as well um and so with that came like so much shame and um and like guilt you know like reflecting on sexual experiences you know a lot of the uh, like i said there was a period of five years where i every single time i had sex it was there was the alcohol involved you know and so we know that's not conducive for consent, you know, or or positive, beneficial, pleasurable sexual experiences at all. Uh, so, um, yeah, so just had like a lot of this weight that I was navigating, and thankfully, you know, I, I see a professional supervisor, I also see a counselor, um, and I've got a men's group as well. So I was able to unpack that. But 
I don't think that's a space that's held for a lot of men to have those realizations. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I will ask men when I do work with them is, have you ever said no to sex? Have you ever, have you ever turned out sex? And very often I get guys saying, no, no, I can't remember the last time I said no. Like I, I will say yes to sex uh, all the time. And again, partly because there's like that scarcity mentality, partly because there's the expectation, partly because they don't want to disappoint their partner. If they're, you know, if they're in a relationship, their partner propositions, like he, he will say yes, because he doesn't want to disappoint her or let her down. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is um, important to like extrapolate from this myth is something else, which is uh, a bit more serious. And so this is maybe a bit of a content warning as well, is um, the myth that men can't be raped right like that's like if if men want to have sex all the time if men say yes to sex all the time uh then the extrapolation of that particularly when we start to look at another myth which is like erections equal arousal and arousal equal equal erections this idea of like physical and psychological arousal being the same thing um they're not so you know uh, a person with a penis a man can have an erection without being turned on and can be turned on without having an erection. They're, they're two separate processes. The difference there is called arousal non-concordance. Um, it's, it's the same thing, you know, if you've got a, a, a vagina, lubrication and engorgement and subjective, you know, turn on as well. Those two things are, are um, mutually exclusive. But the, the statistic that I often share here is men that have been sexually assaulted, about 50 to 60% of them, um, Will experience an erection during their assault and about 20 percent of them will uh, ejaculate uh, from their uh, from their assault and that because people don't the average person doesn't know about arousal and importance and so the assumption then is like oh well he might he had an erection it must have been he enjoyed it, it must have been he liked it. it must have been that it wasn't actually Rape. And don't men just want to have sex anyway? Like, how can a man be, be raped, particularly if it's by a woman as well? Um, so there's like a lot of, a lot of, um, yeah, stigma and taboo around like men's experiences of sexual assault because of these kind of myths around about men's sexuality, around masculinity, around you know the like you know, inherent power dynamics as well. You know, like if a guy does get sexually assaulted, it must mean that he's less of a man especially if like if it's by like another man as well like there's there's a lot of stuff that wraps up in those and i think they, they that stems from these these myths about like male sexuality and libido and sex drive and um and uh and and you know misunderstandings about the male body as well so it, it extrapolates out into it's some pretty um you know not nice uh thinkings but, you know I, I, i'm just rambling now but there's one last thing i want to say here is uh in and something I noticed in relationships as well is like again that myth that like arousal equals erection is you know guys who do want to be there, you know, guys who do want to have sex and you know who who do desire to be sexual with their partner and they're aroused and they're turned on, but they don't have an erection. They can think something's wrong with them, uh, their partners can think something's wrong with them. Uh, a lot of guys will come to me kind of self-diagnosing with erectile dysfunction because they didn't get an erection a couple of times and you know, these are some of the younger guys you know like in their in their um, early to mid 20s and they don't have erectile dysfunction they are just experiencing arousal non-concordance and very typically the solution to that is relax give yourself some more time and don't put so much pressure on getting an erection immediately like you possibly see in pornography right there's 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 the whole conversation that i typically have with guys around like the the like the symbology and the, and the myth of erections as well like this idea that you're supposed to have an erection immediately uh, and that being flaccid or being soft again the, the language there is like quite telling like a lot of guys don't want to be soft right they want to be men right but to be flaccid to be soft to be limp uh is is seen as like a bad thing and so like the the expectations that their cock is supposed to be hard immediately and then they're able to penetrate immediately then they're able to last for for yeah, you know, 45 minutes, you know, pusting in and out, you know, kind of thrusting in and out like a car piston, you know, like just, you know, uh, like a machine. Uh, and that that tends to be the overall assumption about men is that they are 
machines, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. uh, I know that's like something that Bell Hooks explores in her book, right? The will to change is like this, uh, this, yeah, kind of assumption that that uh, men are kind of robotic in that sense, and that's also been perpetuated by sexological research for like the last 50 years this is just treating like men's sexual concerns as function issues as hydraulic issues as Leon Ortega likes to say and so the the approach has been like oh we'll just medicalize it we'll pathologize it and then medicalize it right and uh, I personally think there's been an over pathologization and, and over medicalization of just normal variations in male sexual response uh you know if he I said I, I alluded to before if he's not having thoughts about sex all the time and wanting to have sex you know seven times a day something must be wrong with him we'll just give him testosterone we'll just you know fix the the broken part of him if he's not getting erections you know at the drop of a hat and he's not having erections immediately then uh we'll just give him cialis viagra we'll just we'll, we'll fix the problem with a with a pill right or with a new input so the, the function or the malfunction as i like to say rather than dysfunction um becomes like a becomes fixed or you know now we're getting low dose SSRIs prescribed to guys that are experiencing quick ejaculation. Again, don't worry about don't worry about unpacking his experience as a human being and all the potential things that could be going into it. No, we'll just fix it with a pill. Um, and mm. and if like there's a flattening of men from what I have observed, like guys are just um, their experiences as, as human beings as as men is like discounted for like they're just you know it's just mechanics it's just like fix this input and things will be things will be better don't worry about all the emotional uh elements or or you know personal or psychological elements that go into him experiencing his sexuality and, and his pleasure and his arousal and his relationship um yeah i'm kind of just going on from a huge tangent now caroline but Cam, it, I... it made sense I speak for everyone who's listening to you right now that I just like want to put put a little sow a little seed and just have you ramble because <laughs> over you know in quotes because everything you're saying is probably a revelation for a lot of people um, and it's so important right because we talk a lot about women's sexual objectification and how that dehumanizes them but we don't talk much about how treating men like sex machines dehumanizes them. It, it's, it commodifies them. It makes them right into an object that is supposed to perform. And as you're pointing out, it sends the message that they can't be raped. Uh, it promotes a lot of unwanted sex, which we know, you know, I, one study I read recently, uh, was it around 70% of hookups are unwanted sex uh, for, from at least one party? Uh, not, not rape, but unwanted sex, meaning you're going ahead with it, but you actually don't want to do it. And then something we were discussing earlier, the type of sex, right, that, that new data has come out, Peggy Bornstein's data published in the New York Times, that asphyxiation has now went from nothing, ne negligible amounts a decade ago to about 60% of sexual acts for young people today, and that obviously being driven by porn. And now we're finding, you know, that there are, there's cognitive decline with women in their 20s who've had repeated experiences of being choked because it's actually not men who are choked very often it's it's almost exclusively men choking women and it's become a normal part of the sex act because of porn and because of kind of the mainstreaming of choking and some of our more you know more widely viewed content and, and not to moralize but to look at this empirically and say you know what the thing that broke my heart was looking at the transcripts from the men who were saying well I don't want to do this it's not something I enjoy but she expects it, right? And so this whole idea that there are all of these scripts that are in play, and if they're shifting that rapidly, they're coming from the culture, right? And so you're really invested in giving men power back, right? They're humanizing them so that they can explore their emotions and, and how their bodies work. Um, and I want to ask a really practical question, which is, you've got a man in front of you, you have you in front of you at 17. Um, what are you, what practical steps are you taking him through to both get in touch with his emotions and intimacy? Um, what physically, like what exercises are you having him do? Um, what sort of therapy and other sorts of care? Uh, maybe you're having him do Pilates and yoga. I don't know, but what, what practical advice are you giving? Yeah, I would be giving him encouragement, I suppose, just extending an invitation to him to do something that connects him to his body in a way that isn't like isn't sport 
right? Because a lot of guys, especially younger dudes, they're interested in sport. They might be playing football, basketball, soccer, you know, the major ones like I did. But, uh, and, and that's great, you know, I've got nothing against sport, but I often find that it's not really a practice whereby they're paying attention to their body, right? I didn't pay attention to my body when I was playing sport. I was just like, I've got to perform essentially, right? Um, and that performance carried over into other areas of my life. So one of the things I'd be suggesting is, yeah, go and go and start a Pilates class or a yoga class or go and do something that's going to move your body in a way that isn't to perform, right? And to win a, a, a sporting competition, but to slow you down and to tune in with like the physical sensations that you're experiencing. I think that's a really crucial part. And then the other one is similarly, like go and, go and speak with someone about stuff. Could be a counselor, a psychologist, a men's group a trusted friend like have vulnerable conversations where you're supported to lean into that vulnerability where you're supported to you know open up a little bit more and share some of your 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 insecurities and anxieties uh, so again it doesn't have to be via uh, you know the root of traditional talk therapy because there's other spaces available but just having an opportunity to have those conversations where you're not shamed or shut down for trying to open up and if you if you can uh, make sure there's no alcohol involved as well. I, I kind of laugh at, at that because particularly when I was young, a lot of like the vulnerable conversations that I had were facilitated by alcohol. So I, I remember having some like really, what we call here in Australia, uh, deep and meaningful conversations or abbreviated to D and M's. Uh, so I had a lot of D and M's with my mates at like three o'clock in the morning off my face, feeling like super cathartic and you know releasing all of this like stuff that I've been holding onto. And then not remembering it the next day and feeling absolutely tragic because I was super hungover. So like, so I think it's important to talk, but making sure that that, you know, isn't facilitated by, by booze is another one. Uh, and if I'm talking to a 17 year old version of me, he definitely needed to hear that. Um, and then the other thing that I want to like some advice, I suppose that I give to, to a younger version of myself is, um, you know, like not, not, I don't know how to say this as, as compassionately as possible, but don't give a fuck what other people think. You know, like one of the things that was like really impactful for my life as a younger person was like how much I, how much I cared about particularly men's, you know, perceptions of me. I didn't want to be seen as feminine or effeminate or weak or unmanly or gay, as I mentioned before, right? There was a lot of, I expended a lot of energy in, in like worrying about the way I was being perceived by others. And that influenced the things that I did in my behavior. And so, you know, if I could extend to a younger version of myself or younger, younger men and boys, like it doesn't matter what other people think about you, what you think about you, right? And then that's, and, you know, it, that's hard to, like, sure, intellectually, conceptually, we can kind of say that, but that's hard to really like embody. I still find myself worrying about what others think about me today right and so it's a it's a kind of lifelong journey of unpacking that and really letting go of it but um but yeah just giving like that invitation to like do the things do the weird things that you're interested in you know that you've been afraid to do because you're worried that you might get bullied by your mates like do those things like find the people that are going to support you one of the things i haven't mentioned but like i think it maybe it's important to share around this is there was a period of time where I felt actually quite lonely as a younger man. Um, I was probably around 22, 23. My friendship group really shifted because the friends that I had during college, because that's when I was and I was drinking the most. Um, it was also when I started doing all my my therapy and modalities as well. But like that friendship group knew me as a young dude who drank a lot, and then I stopped drinking so much, and a lot of that friendship group weren't very supportive of that. They knew me as someone who would come out onto the town and like you know, paint the town red and just go, you know, pretty crazy. And then when I stopped doing that, I got I got teased by them. I said, "What are you a apologist my language? Right? What are you a fucking pussy? Like, come on, bro! Like, what are you doing? Like, there was like a, uh, yeah, there was a shaming of me wanting to better myself and uh, and and ch change my behavior. And so I disengaged from that friendship group i also moved back to australia as well so like that helped but um there was like this identity formation that was happening for me around 22 that was like i don't know who my friends are 
and I, and I, yeah, I felt lonely and I felt like I didn't really have anyone in my life that who was, a, you know, who were men that I could really relate to. So it was a process of reaching out to and putting myself in situations where I'd meet other guys who were interested in the things that I did. So that's where I started going to some events, uh, men's groups, things like that, where I knew there was like going to be dudes who were supportive of the things that I wanted to talk about and were interested in like uplifting me and, and wanting the best for me. And, uh, and so, you know, I still, I'm still friends with those guys now, eight years later. And some of them are, you know, my God, you know, one man is my God, uh, his godfather to my son. Uh, another one was my best man at my wedding. Like, you know, it's, it's been amazing to, to have that male friendship now, but there was a period of time where I didn't want to do the traditionally stereotypically male things that all my friends at that time were doing. And I broke away and I felt like really isolated and, um, yeah, and so that was a pretty that was a pretty um, tumultuous little time as well for me emotionally. So previous uh, experts have spoken about the man box, right, and how homophobia and sexism are the pressure that you get from boys and and men to stay in that box, and that how you kind of breaking free from that box or starting that journey then left you quite lonely. And Brad Gage talked about the epidemic of male loneliness um last interview and i i'm curious your thoughts on this like what you know one of the myths that comes up is that men aren't emotional or don't need emotional intimacy with sex right because it's a quantity game not a quality game um can you speak to that mass of things i i just threw at you right the man box and the epidemic of male loneliness and how emotional intimacy ties in with all of that yeah i am a big fan of the uh, man box concept that comes from paul kibble and his work from the 1980s with the oakland men's project and so big big proponent of like that being talked more about what i have found in um the last kind of like 20 years uh, is that that box has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller for a lot of guys and that's partly uh socioculturally because there's been an increase in like women entering into you know, historically men's spaces think you know work sites for example and and other professions but also like things um you know, you know in terms of uh, taking up space right in in, in social uh, cultural discourse as well like a lot of guys that man box for them is framed as anything that isn't feminine i, I often think that masculinity is defined negatively by anything that isn't femininity and so because there's been you know this uh, surge of women uh, doing like work and traditionally like I don't say traditionally but, like historically male things a lot of guys have felt like oh well if women are there then that must be a feminine thing and so the things that make me masculine are now kind of getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, and so I, I partly feel like that's where some of the retaliation and pushback from men you know, misogynistic men you know are is, is coming from is from this like feeling of like being more and more confined to to this box when the solution to this is just fuck the box off in the first place. <laughs> who, who gives a fuck about the box, right? Um, so uh, I just want to put that in there because I, fi- I feel like that's um, something that I've observed over the last couple of years as well. Uh, but the um, the box is, is, as you kind of mentioned, is, is like hierarchical as well, right? So like the person who uh, doesn't fit in the man box is bullied and pushed to the bottom of the, the hierarchy. And so very often what that person does and this has been true for me as well is in order to get back in the box and not be bullied and you know to climb that kind of hierarchical run i gotta push someone below me i gotta bully someone i gotta maybe be violent to someone and show that like they're below me so that they're out of the box and i'm in the box again uh, so i'm not the person that's on the receiving end of the bullying um and so that policing is something that that I've experienced from a lot of guys and, and I've participated in myself. Like, you know, I, I've, I've yeah, bullied guys for not being quote unquote in the box, so to speak. And I've been bullied for not quote unquote being in the box. Um, and so I think that contributes that policing, right? That like tension around, like, is this guy going to think less of me is one of the things that stops men from being emotional and intimate and vulnerable with one another. Right? Because this fear of like, oh, this dude's gonna bully me, right? For 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 not being masculine or, or manly enough. And we kind of know this is such a cliche thing to say, but like that emotions and vulnerability are coded 
as feminine in society, right? So like, I don't, I don't think it's a controversial thing to say. And so one of the things that like a lot of guys will equate emotional expression to is women and femininity and, and effeminacy, right? And so again, because the man box is anything that isn't feminine to express emotions is seen as feminine. And so therefore I can't do that. And like that, that and that gets policed by the other men around them. And so it becomes this like, self-fulfilling prophecy of guys just like more and more isolating more and more you know feeling like they need to um you know do things by themselves like that lone wolf mentality i don't want to get too deep into this but like that's also like socio-politically as well there's like a real individualistic pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mentality here in this kind of you know neoliberal society that we occupy and so i think that also feeds into like men's experiences of loneliness and isolation as well as like they need to be able to do things by themselves they need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps they need to be the person who is their own savior don't be a victim that kind of thing like it's all tailored towards like that individualistic way of thinking about um how you show up as a man i suppose and um one of the uh one of the things that like my male friendship group have done is like put an end to lone wolfing to have kind of like little catchphrase when we invite new men into the space uh, and we're uh we're co-wolfing instead of lone wolfing that's our like little catchphrase uh when we talk to to guys um and so like that's the you know that kind of collective um communal approach uh, to like male spaces is something that has been something i'm trying to explore trying to do more of and like trying to encourage other guys to 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 lean into um you know and, and one of the strategies for this you know has been at least in my observation because you know there's like a okay so there's what i've noticed is there's like a tension around saying that men need their own spaces right like there's not so much tension around saying women need their own spaces or trans folks need their own spaces or queer folks need their own spaces. But when it's men, cis, het, white men need their own spaces, it conjures up images of, um, you know, extremists, you know, and I, I think that a valid point. Um, and also like men need to be in spaces where they're recognized or their gendered experiences as men and that they have interactions with the world that are based on their gender and on their you know lived experience as a man and that needs to be acknowledged and that needs to be um catered to in those spaces i think one of the reasons why misogynistic online influencers whose names i won't mention are so popular is because they acknowledge men's pain and they recognize men as men and they kind of acknowledge the gendered experiences that men have as men in the world. And they obviously point men in a misogynistic direction and say, you know, it's all women's fault that you're having these experiences. And so I don't agree with their worldview, but the reason why I think they're quite popular is because of the acknowledgement that they're doing that men have lived experiences in the world as men and that they're, those are unique experiences and that there's pain wrapped up and hurt wrapped up in those experiences. Uh, and so like th this is like a call to action that i've given to people in our our um kind of respective fields is like we've got to do the same thing right we've got to acknowledge that there's pain for for men that there's you know that their lived experience as a man is you know a unique experience a gendered experience and that there's um you know there's things that need to be taken into consideration because of that and so that's like something that i'm i'm an advocate for men's spaces around uh, is like is because of that. And one of the avenues that I've been exploring, I suppose, to try and get dudes to to invest in coming into those spaces and like and and combating that loneliness and that isolation that they feel, because uh, a lot of guys are feeling that is um is like leveraging a lot of guys. Uh, I, I alluded to this before, but a lot of guys' competitiveness and performance and and you know uh and affinity for sport so the men's group that i host with a friend of mine uh on a thursday morning is a it's a fitness group we go on we 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 have an outdoor gym that we have at someone's house and we sling some kettlebells around and we you know have some dumbbells and we do some push-ups and things like that and it's just a, a you know it's a way to get guys in their body 
and then after we do a workout together, we jump down on some yoga mats, we have a cup of coffee and we check in. We have a very simple check-in process. It's what's a, something you want to celebrate this last week since we last met? Right, what's a win? What is something that's been a challenge for you? Right, what are you struggling with? And what's something you want to be held accountable for next week? What are you committed to that we can check in with you next week around and see if you've done it? Uh, and that's it. We don't, like, there's not, like, it's open-ended in the sense of, like, you know, what do you want to check in with? But it's not, like, free-flowing conversations. It's, like, these are the three things. These are the three points. Like, let's let's go around in a circle and let's just, like, you know, do that. And so the structure for it is, like, really helpful for guys. Uh, the accountability piece is really helpful for guys as well. It makes them feel, like, supported and, and like, they're, um, you know, they've got some people, some men in their life that are, like, wanting the best for them. You know, um, so it ticks a lot of the things, a lot of the boxes that like I was speaking before about like my experience of isolation. Like I didn't have guys doing that for me. So um, I share that because I, I get a lot of questions like, how can we do that? What do we do? How do we create men's spaces? And so I want to give like some really practical things there. It's like get them moving their body, have a very structured, simple check-in process. That's like the two major things. If you can do that, you'll that'll resonate a lot with guys, at least in my experience anyway. So Hopefully that answered a few of the things yes. you kind of... You, you yes, thank you, Cam. <laughs> I think we might have time for one question, maybe two. Let's see. Um, let me throw a controversial one at you. Uh, do you think that younger generations of boys and men are getting new and healthier messages around sex on social media? Are you hopeful when it comes to the chokehold porn house on younger men? And I know you you have a pretty complicated approach to pornography because it's a complicated subject. Yeah, uh, you know, I think it's both. I think that there, I think social media is both a tool that allows people like myself and yourself to share some, you know, positive messages, uh, beneficial, nuanced messages about sexuality and masculinity. And guys have access to that. Young boys have access to that, right? Um, and social media also platforms people that share horrible messages around masculinity and sexuality and uh, relationships. Unfortunately, social media also is run on algorithmic outrage, essentially. And so the posts that are really divisive and that are really, um, you know, that outrage farm clicks essentially do a lot better than posts that are sincerely educating and offering nuanced perspectives and trying to promote healthy, positive expressions of sexuality. Uh, I don't know what to do about that. That's beyond my paycheck, I suppose. Um, but like, that's that's an issue. So I don't think social media is inherently bad. I think there are some really beautiful messages that are coming through and um, it's about signal boosting those. And that's as far, kind of as far as I can go down that road. Like again, that's kind of outside my wheelhouse. Um, I, I feel similarly uh, like about pornography. like. Pornography, I don't think, is inherently evil. Uh, I think pornography, in much the same way that all other media, is uh, morally neutral. It's like the the systems in place that create the exploitation, that create the disenfranchisement. And so there is like some really beautiful, artistic, ethical, some might say feminist and educational, diverse pornography out there. It gets buried in the conglomerates that of you know mind freak and, and things like that. Like there's there's a lot of shit porn out there, right? There's a lot of like really exploitative and unhelpful negative messages uh, from a lot of mainstream pornography. In the same way that like social media has a lot of like misogynistic, uh, exploitative, and um, horrible information misinformation on that um so it's about right, how do we get the messages that are positive and beneficial and healthy to the forefront how do we signal boost those right I, I think a common a common claim is that and and the data kind of suggests this as well right caroline was like people particularly boys men are reenacting what they see in porn they're they're the message they're, they're onboarding messages from pornography right so what if the messages from pornography weren't actually bad? What if the messages were about consent and about pleasure positivity and about inclusive bodies and about like exploring each other and communicating? What if those were the messages they were getting from porn? 
right? And so there is porn that is created specifically like that. It's about getting that to the front of the algorithm so that when people you know, type in porn into Google, they don't get you know, mainstream tube site stuff. They get stuff that's more inclusive, more diverse and more positive. And it is, is you know, if they're going to reenact it, they're reenacting stuff that's like really, you know, consensual and pleasure positive and, um, you know, communicative and, and maybe practicing safe sex as well, right? Like there's some stuff there that I think is, um, again, like there's algorithmic influence there, which is, which is a big problem. Um, and so, again, I don't know what the solution is to that except to just keep signal boosting and educating like ethical sites and people that are doing like good sexual education um because well, Cam, that good messages out there the porn you're describing wouldn't wouldn't fit the addiction profit model right so i mean no. this is a, such a much longer conversation um what what incredible ground we have covered and i'll just since we're short on time and i know there are a number of great questions in the queue and i'm going to encourage folks to reach out to you directly um last question where can we find your work like what are you doing and where can we follow you and find your work yes yeah, so i i live to social media i am on social media at the cam fraser on all social media platforms uh particularly Instagram and TikTok. If you find me on those two platforms, that'll be where you get the most engagement from me because it's, it's a nightmare trying to balance like six different platforms, but uh, I'm most active on those two. Uh, I've also got a website, which is cam-fraser.com. It's a bunch of free resources on there as well. Uh, I try and educate freely as much as possible. Uh, that includes a podcast called Men, Sex and Pleasure. And there's like 200 odd episodes on there. Uh, you've been on Caroline, which I'm so grateful for. And um, yeah, there's the, the, there's a newsletter that, that goes out like once a week as well. So yeah, there's, there's a few ways. If you if you find if you type me into Google Cam Fraser, that's F R A S E R, you'll find me. And um, and yeah, just come and shoot me a message or you know say hey, and I'm happy to happy to chat with folks. It's all it's all me. I'm a one man show. It's just me running the the ship. So um, you'll you'll find me some way or other. Wonderful. And you can get the first chapter of your book on your website. Uh, it's a book I highly recommend um, parents, teachers, educators, anyone working with young men. Uh, it's just been a joy to talk with you and to learn about your journey and to learn from you, Cam. Thank you so much for your work. No, thank you for having me and for, for using your platform to have these conversations as well. I, I really appreciate it. All right. Well, have a glorious day. Bye, y'all. Thank you for joining us.